This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad you're here, even if we are encountering one another in this digital fashion. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, turn and be gracious to us. For us, the road is long and we are weary. We feel beaten down by the trials of life and we need your strength to sustain us. Show us your favor and offer us your blessing that we may abide in faithfulness and not be put to shame. Comfort us, O God, and revive our souls. Grant us the endurance to take up our cross and to follow the difficult roads in life. The scriptures that I'm going to share with you today on this, this third Sunday after Pentecost come to us from the book of Genesis for our Old Testament lesson. We will visit Paul's letter to the Romans for our New Testament or epistle lesson. And our gospel lesson today comes to us from the gospel of Matthew. Hear now the word of our Lord from Genesis chapter 21 beginning at the 8th verse. The boy grew and stopped nursing. On the day he stopped nursing, Abraham prepared a huge banquet. Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing, the one Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, send this servant away with her son. This servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son Isaac. This upset Abraham terribly because the boy was his son. God said to Abraham, don't be upset about the boy and your servant. Do everything Sarah tells you to do because your descendants will be traced through Isaac. But I will make of your servant's son a great nation too because he is also your descendant. Abraham got up early in the morning, took some bread and a flask of water and gave it to Hagar. He put the boy in her shoulder sling and sent her away. She left and wandered through the desert near Beersheba. Finally, the water in the flask ran out and she put the boy down under one of the desert shrubs. She walked away from him about as far as a bow shot and sat down telling herself, I can't bear to see the boy die. She sat down at a distance, cried out in grief and wept. God heard the boy's cries and God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up. Pick up the boy and take him by the hand because I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw well. She went over, filled the water flask and gave the boy a drink. God remained with the boy. He grew up, lived in the desert and became an expert archer. He lived in the Paran Desert and his mother found him an Egyptian wife. In Paul's letters to letter to the Romans, sixth chapter, beginning halfway through the first verse and continuing on through the 11th verse, we hear these words from the apostle speaking to the people of God saying, should we continue sinning so grace will multiply? Absolutely not. All of us died to sin. How can we still live in it? Or don't you know that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried together with him through baptism into his death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can walk in newness of life. If we were united together in a death like his, we will also be united together in a resurrection like his. This is what we know. The person that we used to be was crucified with him in order to get rid of the corpse that had been controlled by sin. That way we wouldn't be slave to, slaves to sin anymore, because a person who has died has been freed from sin's power. But if we died with Christ, we have faith that we will also live with him. We know that Christ has been raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. He died to sin once and for all with his death, but he lives for God with his life. In the same way, you also should consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive for God in Christ Jesus. 
And I invite you now to hear the good news from the Gospel of Matthew, the 24th chapter, verses 24 through 39, as Jesus, speaking to the people of God, says, Disciples aren't greater than their teacher, and slaves aren't greater than their master. It's enough for disciples to be like their teacher and slaves like their master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, it's certain that they will call the members of his household by even worse names. Therefore, don't be afraid of those people because nothing is hidden that won't be revealed and nothing secret that won't be brought into the open. What I say to you in darkness, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, announced from the rooftops. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the, so the soul. Instead, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a small coin? But not even one of them will fall to the ground without your father knowing about it already. Even the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before people, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But everyone who denies me before people, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Don't think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. People's enemies are members of their own households. Those who love father or mother more than me aren't worthy of thee. Those who love son or daughter more than me aren't worthy of me. Those who don't pick up their crosses and follow me aren't worthy of me. Those who find their lives will lose them. And those who lose their lives because of me will find them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, we, we encounter what is really, it's, well, it's an interesting snapshot of life in our Old Testament today. And the, and the passage that we visited today actually comes, comes along fairly late in the story of Hagar. She is that Egyptian girl who was a slave owned by Sarah, the wife of Abraham. So to kind of better understand this particular story, as well as the lesson that it has for us in our lives today, I'm going to kind of give you the, the condensed version of what happened earlier. As you may recall from Sunday school and, and other Bible studies, God had promised Abraham that he would give him a multitude of descendants, which was troublesome to them because Sarah, his wife, hadn't been able to have any children. So finally, in a move born of depth, desperation as well as impatient, impatience, Sarah decides to send in her slave girl, Hagar, this little Egyptian girl, so that Abraham can impregnate her. And since she's actually Sarah's property, her child, then, would be Sarah's child. Yeah, sounds weird to us now, but, but that was the logic that Sarah and Abraham were using. The Bible doesn't record how Hagar felt about this arrangement. But she was a slave, and she had no choice other than to be used, and she was used, as her owner wanted. Well, Hagar does become pregnant, and she gives birth to Abraham's firstborn child, a son, Ishmael. And therefore, Ishmael is the rightful heir to Abraham's estate. <coughs> Excuse me. But this all starts kind of a, a, a sequence of events, problems, and motion, because Hagar, having been used like this, decides that now her status has changed, because she's now the mother of Abraham's daughter. And this should bring her up considerably in the pecking order in that household. So she becomes really disrespectful of Sarah. And this, of course, does not go over well at all with Sarah, who then tells Abraham to get rid of this troublemaker Hagar. After all, they've got the heir. Now they have Ishmael. Why put up 
with some uppity slave girl. Well, Abraham is able to, to get things calmed down, and Hagar does stay in the household, but then Sarah finally gives birth to a son of her own. And that really changes things in the household because now Sarah feels that she doesn't need Hagar, she doesn't need Ishmael any longer, and in fact, she views Ishmael as a threat to the inheritance that Sarah wants for her own biological son, Isaac. So, she goes to Abraham and tells him that he's got to kick Hagar and Ishmael out of the house and into the desert. And it's interesting for me to notice that while the Bible does seem to take note of Abraham's anguish over his son leaving, he doesn't seem to have that level of feeling for poor Hagar. And eventually they go. He kicks them off out into the desert, gives them a little loaf of bread and a bag of water, and out into the wilderness they go, all on their lonesome. Think for a moment. Can you imagine how Hagar must have felt at that point in time? I mean, you talk about being used, abused, and then cast aside. She had certainly experienced all of that, and now that she's been used up, she's been thrown out, she finds that her physical and her emotional strength fade until she finally gets to that place where she just can't see any hope. None. So she gives up. She sets herself down to wait to die. That's her story. That's kind of where we encounter it today. And it's an interesting story. It's, it's one that I have long loved. Really, I have, because in this story of this Egyptian slave girl who was used, abused, and then cast aside, we can see a bit of ourselves. We can, if we care to look. Because the truth is that a lot of us have lived lives that have been less than perfect. Some of us, much, much less than perfect. You know, we've made our fair share of mistakes. And then at times, there are those events that are really beyond our control, whether it be the loss of a job, um, maybe it's addictions, concerns about our health or the health of someone that we love, or relationship problems, and a host of other things. They can get us to this point where we feel ourselves to be, to be lost in this, this barren desert, if you will, that can be what human life feels like on this earth. There can be those times when, when our physical, emotional strength feels utterly spent. We can find ourselves mentally, if not physically, right where Hagar was. At that point in our lives when we just have nothing left. And in our exhaustion, we can just give up. Give up on ourselves on the world around us. It happens. I know it does. I've been there. I've been there in that awful, barren desert of, of despair and depression where, where death begins to appear as a means of, of just having your pain stop. Oh, yeah. I've been there. So I know that's not a good place to be when you're just used up and, and ready to give up. And that, I think... Is, is why the story of Hagar continues to speak so loudly to me. It does. I want you to notice what happens then in this story. Because Hagar feels utterly defeated. Utterly defeated by the trials of life. She is worn out. She has no strength to go on. So she just gives up. However, even though Hagar may have given up on Hagar... God does not give up on Hagar. Because in the, just in the depths of her, her seemingly hopeless situation, God takes the initiative and God comes to Hagar. God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up, pick up the boy, 
Take him by the hand because I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well. Notice how this is worded. God didn't suddenly create a well, but rather God opened Hagar's eyes. He enabled her to see what was already there. What Hagar needed to survive was already there, but in the depths of her depression and her fear and her exhaustion, she didn't or couldn't see it. So God came to her. God lovingly opened her eyes so that she could see the salvation, the life that God had provided for her. God did that for Hagar. Outcast of society. We need to realize something important as we revisit that story. And that is that God has not changed in the thousands of years since he saved Hagar. God still sees, God still cares for us, even those of us who in the midst of our own struggles and our own despair manage to lose sight of God. You know, in our gospel lesson moments ago, Jesus tells us, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Instead, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a small coin? But not one of them will fall to the ground without your father knowing about it already. Even the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid, Jesus tells us. You are worth more than many sparrows. God knows our circumstances. God knows our weaknesses, our problems, and our fears. And our God, who greatly values us, is eager to help us. And, as was the case with Hagar, what we need, you and I, what we need in order to live as God wants for us to live is already here. You see, God's unsurpassable power, God's limitless grace, they're already here. And they are available to you right now. You need to remember, God knows who you are. God knows what you are experiencing, and God greatly values you, even you, just as you are. And because God values you so much, God offers you a gift, a life-saving gift, the gift of the living water that is faith in Jesus Christ. And that is important. You know, Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans that we visited moments ago, he reminds us that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can walk in newness of life. Just as God rescued Hagar and Ishmael from the desert and gave them life, and just as God raised Jesus up from the dead and gave him everlasting life, so also will God rescue you from the barren deserts of earthly despair and raise you up to a new and everlasting life. The gift of life, the, the living water, as Jesus refers to himself, is, is life-changing. It's a life-giving gift. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And that gift is already here and it is available to you just as you are, right where you are, right here and right now. It's yours for the asking and for the taking. May each of you open your eyes and open your hearts to the water in the desert that God has provided for you. 
believe in our Lord Jesus Christ and know with, with complete certainty that this gift of living water, faith in Jesus, is sufficient to carry you through all of the trials and the arid deserts of earthly life and that it will bring you all the way to God's side where you will live in perfect peace for all of the days that are to come. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us pray, brothers and sisters. Gracious, almighty, eternal God, we confess to you that, yes, sometimes the, the trials of life on this earth can drive us out into this barren, spiritual, emotional desert where we find that our own strength is utterly inadequate to meet our needs. We need help, O oh God. We need you. Open our eyes and our hearts to the living water that you have already provided for us in Jesus Christ. Help us to believe in him so that we may enjoy the blessings of his teaching and strength right now, as well as your unending comfort, comfort and company in the days that are to come. And even as we pray to you today, we acknowledge that so many of our neighbors are still lost out there in their own barren deserts. They need help too. Ask, help us, O oh Lord. Help us to, to be those messengers of the good news that those people need to hear so that they too may come to you, so that they too can enjoy the blessing of living water that is Jesus Christ our Lord. And in this time of unrest and uncertainty, we pray for peace, O oh God. We pray for healing for all who are suffering from illness or injury. We pray for hope. And all of this we bring to you today in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, as we prepare to, to depart this time together, to go forth into the world, to share the good news. Let's pray about that in our prayer for going forth. Creator, Redeemer God, be with me as I go out into the world. Open my eyes and my heart to the opportunities that you provide for me to serve you and to love my neighbors. Daily give me the wisdom and courage that I need to be an effective servant. In Jesus' name.